So I'm Larry Jamison, the Dean of the Perlman School of Medicine. You know, many of the alums I've, I've had a chance to meet in years pre-COVID, but it has been really three, three long years since we've been able to do things in person. And we kept trying to schedule them and hold them, and then we'd have to cancel. And then we'd try to schedule and hold, and I was afraid it might happen this time, but so far, so good. We're actually pulling it off. But I appreciate everyone coming. Uh, the medical students who are here, thanks so much for coming out uh, to meet some of the donors of scholarships and, and some of the alums. Uh, th these are two incredibly talented groups, the alumni group and the medical students. And you know, each, each in your own way, you're very special. So I think for the alums, as, as you have a chance to talk with some of the students and hear a little bit about their backgrounds and their interests, uh, you'll immediately see you know, how special our classes are these days. And reciprocally for the students, uh, if you can just tap in a little bit to the career path of some of the alumni, uh, you'll see your future in front of you uh, because they really have paved the way uh, reputationally and practically and I'm sure they're available to be advisors, give you uh, lots of guidance along the way. So this is a very special event, and there's really nothing better than if, if we can have an in-person meeting between some of the scholarship donors and the recipients. It, it doesn't always work out because a lot of our alumni aren't going to show up until Saturday when they have the reunion dinners, uh, but when it does, it's great. So the team has given me some numbers I want to share with you. Uh, the first is, we have scholarships right now for 334 MD students. I mean, it's a, it's a huge number. Now, it's really important because we've chosen to have a relatively large class. So our, our typical entering class is between Oh, 150 and 160 per year. But more than most schools, our students choose to do the MD, PhD, or some additional degree, or get a certificate, or take a year out to do research. So really, the, the aggregate number of students here is larger than 155 times four. You know, it's more like 800 plus because the MD, PhD students alone, which is a large number, end up staying you know, seven or eight years. And so these scholarships make a huge difference. Out of the 334, 120 are, are full tuition. And so it, it really, it, it makes an enormous difference, uh, particularly for students whose families or themselves have been financially challenged. It makes possible a career in medicine, and in particular, to get the special training here at the Perlman School of Medicine. So around the corner in the Law Auditorium, Ann and Walter Gamble are, are hosting the reception for the Gamble Scholars. Uh, it's a vibrant group as it always is. Uh, Ann and Walter uh, really have, have kicked off in a very special way the scholarship momentum at this school. Uh, you know, Walter charged the dean two or three deans ago to eventually have scholarships for everyone. And we're, we're on that path, actually. We're, we're making very good progress. But he and Ann have done so much. I, I think all together, they have 65 Gamble Scholars being funded right now. And almost all of them are over in the Law Auditorium. They've been able to meet with their Gamble Scholars by Zoom the last couple of years. The advantage of that, of course, is no one has a mask on and there's a name underneath the photograph on the Zoom screen. Uh, but there's nothing like being in person because Ann and Walter like to keep up with their scholars long after they're medical students. So when they become residents, later on they have families, they want to know about their children, where they live. Uh, so these can be really lifelong uh, relationships. And here we are in the Jordan Medical Education Center. Uh, for the students, this seems like it's always been here. Uh, but for those of you who are alumni, it's probably still totally new. 
It's a fantastic learning environment. Uh, there's always, every time you come to this campus, there's something new. I would be remiss not to have you look behind me and see this large new hospital. Uh, it's a little deceptive to see it from this angle. If you, if you actually go inside and walk the floors, which I, I would encourage you to at least go into the lobbies and look at that space. It's about the size of a, of a football field, actually larger. And so we decided to, to break it up, to segment it into three parts so that it's more functional, more cohesive. Uh, but if, if you happen to be a patient and you're in this environment, it makes a world of difference. Uh, we went around the country and really around the world to extract some of the best ideas about design and function. So just as one small example, uh, when, a, when a student goes into one of the patient rooms because they have an ID badge on, uh, there's a machine that reads that and, and puts their, their picture and their name you know, up on the screen so the patient in the bed can remember and put a name and a face together because when a team comes in and they introduce themselves really quickly, it's, it's overwhelming. Uh, so we've tried to do a lot of small things. There aren't curtains because they catalyze contamination. You punch a button and the windows turn dark. I mean, it's just, it's a remarkable place. And so we, we try to have something new every time you come. That's one of the, the latest things here. But really the, the purpose of this space is to attract and then train uh, physicians for the future. And I think it's really working well. The students treat each other with respect and collaboration. They, they teach one another a lot, as well as learning from our fabulous faculty, our simulation environment. You know, the COVID taught us that we can learn virtually and do some things very well. Now we do some of that, we do some things in person. We've got great outpatient learning environments. So you'll, the, the alumni will be able to hear more about this from Dr. Susie Rose. Susie, raise, raise your hand, Senior Vice Dean for Education. Susie's got a fabulous leadership team. I mean, you've assembled, Susie, just some of the, the best people and teachers uh, to assist in the medical education world. And on Saturday morning, I think it is, there's going to be a, an update on, you know, what it's like to be a medical student at the Perlman School in 2022. So if you have a chance, that's worth going to. And if you can't make it, there'll be a virtual version of that. So we, we just completed our capital campaign at the University of Pennsylvania last year. Uh, for education, we raised 111 million uh, Kate Griffo is here with her team and alumni and development. And Kate, I forget what the goal was, but that was above it. The goal might have been 100. So, you know, well, 10%, 11% above the goal. And if you look underneath the total number in the, in the individual buckets that we're trying to support, you know, each of them was above what we had, had wanted to achieve. So terrific momentum and engagement in that space. A lot, of course, for uh, financial aid. Uh, we've got a new Helen Dickens uh, scholarship. I think many of you would have met Dr. Dickens when you were here in training. Uh, there's now a, a, fa a fabulous exhibit of Helen Dickens' career that's over in, in one of our uh, research building lobbies. So if, if you have a chance to go over to the Stemler building and look at that. It's a fantastic uh, display. Her whole family came out when we cut the ribbon for that and many of, of her friends and, and colleagues. We had a, ter a terrific event for that. So just to give you a sense of the investment in scholarships, since that's why we're here tonight, in FY22, uh, the School of Medicine provided $18 million in MD scholarships alone and $30 million across all the students. Now, a lot of this, of course, includes the, the MD-PhD students. So it's, it's a really significant amount of money, and a lot of it is endowed. So you know, we, can, we can build on this in the future and, and be confident that we're going to be able to have a lot of, of momentum. Uh, 
But if you look across the country, I mean, this, this puts this school in roughly the, the top 5% in terms of scholarships and, and financial aid. It's, it's hard to get all of the data, but it's confidently in the top 5%. And what that means on the other side is that our students are graduating with a lot less debt. So we, you know, our goal ultimately would be no student debt. And if you look at the number of students who are getting scholarships, I think it's about three quarters of the student body are getting scholarships. And, and a lot of them are, are receiving pretty significant scholarships trying to, to offset the financial burden uh, once you graduate. Uh, so you'll see some of these statistics from Dr. Rose and her team, but 60 plus percent of the students, percent of the students have an MD plus degree. So as I mentioned before, MD PhD, MD MBA, public health, bioethics, clinical research. I mean, there are a variety of, of official degrees, but then there are a large number of certificate programs, which are also very substantive and years out to do research. Again, this is very atypical. I think around the country, that number is probably closer to five or 10%. You know, so 60 plus is a, is a lot. And it's a distinctive feature of this group of, of students in the room uh, who really are focused on learning for the future and to be the best professionals they can be. It's not about necessarily trying to hurry up and get through medical school as quickly as possible and come to our graduation on Sunday, which I hope, you know, for those of you who are fourth year, I look forward to seeing you on, on Sunday. Uh, but it's, it's much more this concept of of learning for life, I'm a student in perpetuity, uh, so I, I want to make sure I've got the infrastructure of, of knowledge and experience going into that. Skip Brass, I just want to acknowledge as the longtime director of our MD uh, PhD program. Uh, I can tell you, I'm an MD PhD myself. I, across the country, Dr. Skip Brass is seen as the most accomplished leader of an MD-PhD program, by far. I mean, he has no peer as a leader of these programs across the country. And we now have the largest MD-PhD program in the country, the largest NIH grant to support it, and some of the best laboratories, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, for training in, in the various components of a PhD. And not every PhD is going to the laboratory bench and doing test tube experiments. On Sunday, our graduation speaker is Vanessa Northington Gamble, who got her PhD in history and the sociology of science some years ago. And so you can really tap into the whole university as you go down that path. So I think you're all aware that we're two plus years into the COVID crisis. Uh, it's been hard for our faculty. It's been hard for our clinicians. It's been hard for our medical students. Uh, it's been hard for everyone in this room, for your families. Uh, but I, I think we've done a very good job together as a community of getting through this together, of adapting and making the most of it. And in some ways, uh, I tend to see the cup is half full. You know, what are the lessons that we will take away from COVID that will be useful? So I'll give you one. Uh, epidemiology is now cool, right? I mean, everybody in this room is an epidemiologist. I mean, before, like, nobody wanted to go to the statistics class and learn epidemiology. It was just, you know, it's just numbers and why do I need to know that and that... So it's just an example. Yep. Telehealth and ways to leverage it, uh, particularly for uh, patients and for clinical problems where access can be challenging. You know, tele-remote health is a, is a novel way uh, to try to address that. So there's a long list of things, but I just want to acknowledge that we've all uh, gone through this together. We're not finished with it yet. Uh, but in part because of the, of the vaccines, the technology for which was developed by scientists here, at least 
our broader community is safer. And if and when people contract COVID, hopefully it's not as severe. And we really plan to be able to use that technology as a platform for developing new vaccines and new kinds of treatments going forward. So these are just a few uh, introductory remarks. I wanna thank everyone uh, for coming. And now there are a couple of speakers that I'd like to introduce. Uh, one is an alum and scholarship supporter and the other is a student recipient. So the first uh, will be Dr. Bita Bagheri Dasgib. Uh, you don't come up yet. We're, we're, we're gonna say a, a lot about you before you come up here. Uh, she's here uh, this evening with her family. Her daughter Hannah is going to be a Penn undergrad in the, in the fall. Critiqued her speech, so we know it will be excellent. So for Bita, after eight years as a Penn undergrad herself and a medical student, she's gone on to a superb career as a dermatologist in Orange County, California. She was the first prize winner at the annual Conrad Stritzler Dermatology Resident Competition at the Dermatologic Society of Greater New York and the winner of the American Heart Association Research Scholars Award at Duke University. As a North Carolina grad, I'm not sure what to make of that, but I'll acknowledge it anyway. As the daughter of Iranian immigrants, Bita recognizes the significant role of opportunity in breaking down barriers. She's remained an active part of the Penn community over the years, leading her fellow alums to engage with the school through the Medical Alumni Advisory Council. We abbreviate that as MAC. Dr. Robert Johnson, who leads that group, is with us tonight. Robert, raise your hand. It's, it's really a fantastic organization. And every time I'm anywhere close to the LA area. You, you help welcome me and, and other people there. So we're delighted to have you come back for your 25th reunion as a member of the class of 1997. Bita, podium is yours. Hello. Naomi Shahab Nye once said, before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things. Feel the future, dissolved in the moment, like salt in a weekend broth. Friends, fellow doctors, and my dear PenMed community, when the world as we knew it turned upside down, we all experienced what it was like to lose something. And in losing things, we found out what kindness really meant. We were called to hard things as we donned our hazmat suits. To, find something, to fight something that has never before appeared on Earth. While everyone was sheltering in place, we were on the front lines, battling the unknown. And in that battle, we found of what we were made. They say that generosity blooms from gratitude. And what I'm grateful for besides my wonderful family and my Penn family, for together we battled this thing and came out on the other side with a new strength and a new gratitude for what we can no longer take for granted. My thankfulness for my Penn family started 34 years ago, when Penn took a chance on a 17-year-old girl who had escaped the war in Iran to find refuge here. What struck me the most was that at Penn undergraduate and medical school, I was not treated as a minority, but as a human with potential. If I was curious about a subject, I could study it. If I was passionate about a project, I could bring my vision to life. When I graduated and launched myself into the world, people wondered why I had so much confidence despite being a Middle Eastern immigrant. My answer was that at Penn, I was not treated as a lesser being, but as a human being. And that made all the difference. I have to say that I have not found this kind of egalitarian community since. When my fellow Quakers ask me why they should invest in someone else's education, I like to point out the paradox of happiness and success. That happiness and success cannot be a self-centered pursuit, 
but the effect of our cause to champion for others. And I think of no better cause than nurturing our next generation of pen healers. As Esther Perel says, happiness cannot be a pursuit, cannot be a purpose. Happiness is an outcome of multiple purposes. This pandemic has shown us that we have never needed heroic healers more than we do now. And we have a shortage of them. The question is, as we age, who is going to take care of us as we cede our places to the next generation? That's why my Penn family is so vital. Because at Penn, we shape doctors who care, doctors who innovate, and most importantly, share their knowledge with others. We all know this is not something that is ubiquitous. It's something Penn in particular cultivates in our doctors, which is why I'm so proud to congratulate this year's scholarship recipients. We have seen something in you that inspires us, that causes us to believe that you will take this gift and pay it forward for the rest of your lives. We cannot wait to see what you do with our gift. Welcome. Well, Bita, thank you so much. This, that was a very powerful message. And for the students, uh, she is not only an incredibly accomplished clinician and physician who's very confident in her practice, but the happiness that you reference comes through in your spirit every day. And I'm sure your, your patients and their families are, are comforted uh, and, and feel the warmth and your glow uh, every day. So thanks so much. Uh, now I, I want to introduce uh, the student speaker, soon to be Dr. Shipley in about three days, uh, but not yet, still a medical student. Shannon Shipley was, is a graduating fourth year student. After completing her undergraduate degree at Columbia, she's explored her passion for the human brain, conducting research in the Chen Lab and Penn Medicine's Department of Neurosurgery. Now, despite training in neurosurgery, she decided to go into pediatric neurology. So I'm sure you and Dr. Chen had some interesting discussions about that. <laughs> but it's a great field, and I'm sure you'll be uh, terrific in pediatric neurology. While a student here, she's been a fierce advocate and a leader for the Penn Medicine First Generation Low Income. We, we abbreviate this FIGLI one of the school's affinity groups that offers networking support and community for this group of students. Shannon is an incredible example of how scholarship support can catalyze new opportunities for our students and their fellow classmates. As a member of the class of 2022, you will also be an alum as of Sunday, and we'll welcome you into that group. Shannon, the podium is yours. Thank you so much. It's going to be hard to follow your remarks, Dr. Bagheri. You definitely sold yourself short. <laughs> um, but thank you, Dean Jameson and Dr. Rose, the Office of Financial Aid and the Office of Development and Alumni Relations. I am immensely honored and admittedly, as you will soon tell, <laughs> a bit nervous to be here with you all today. Uh, to share with you a little bit about my path to medicine, and most importantly, if I may, to thank you all for the generosity that you've given all of the students at Perelman School of Medicine. Five-year-old me is in disbelief. <laughs> uh, so I suppose I should briefly introduce myself and with nothing better than my now well-practiced two-minute residency interview monologue. So, hi. I'm Shannon, I'm originally from Colorado, but I grew up outside of Dallas with my single mother and older brother. My mom worked tremendously hard to provide for our little family. She juggled two jobs and 17 hour days, uh, but did not have a college degree and barely earned over minimum wage. I learned early the importance of an education and caring for those around me. Uh, with the help of a healthy dose of tenacity, 
a village worth of support and ample good fortune. I had the opportunity to graduate from the Texas Academy of Math and Science, Columbia University, and now the University of Pennsylvania. I consider myself a very purpose-driven person. Uh, after some formative experiences in my, within my family and close friends in my childhood, I realized that the brain is what makes a person a person, and that, but that most of its inner workings were still largely a mystery. I knew very early and from that point on that I wanted to dedicate my life to figuring the brain out and to serving those who are suffering at the hands of their own minds. That hasn't really wavered since, uh, but really has only flourished as I've gathered experiences at the bedside, in the lab, and through volunteer work. I'm someone who's always thinking, um, most often about the brain, health equity, medical illustration, and sometimes too much ice cream. <laughs> and I intend to spend my days, but I intend to spend my days mostly treating and investigating the consequences of early childhood adversity and acquired neurologic insult. I'm particularly interested in cognitive and neuropsychiatric development and outcomes. Across the journey to get here, my family and I struggled a lot. There were times we couldn't afford meals or medications, times where I wasn't sure if I would be able to afford to stay at Columbia, and many times that I doubted that I'd be able to stand here today with you all graduating, or almost graduating, hopefully, <laughs> from medical school. Uh, recently, reflecting on my time here at PSOM and my journey getting here, I look back at some of my undergraduate journals. Albeit a bit dramatic and angsty, one, ink, <laughs> one entry written October 30th of my junior year after a particularly upsetting phone call with my brother about financial troubles at home nodded loudly to the emotions that I'm feeling here today. So I'd like to share with you an excerpt. But when can I fit time for worrying into my calendar? During a break from studying for my three midterms on Monday? Oh, maybe I have time from 5.30 to 5.55 tomorrow between my neurobiology class and credit union meeting. I guess I can fit in worrying then. Put it on my Google Calendar and sleep well because I know that I have 25 minutes during which I can figure out where all the money is going and how to build a financial model and identify the gaps and calculate precisely how my mom will ever retire. To determine how I will support myself and realistically her too over the next 15 years when I go to medical school. Maybe I just can't. Maybe the numbers simply don't work out. Maybe medical schools have a line of too poor to survive and I'm below it, just like all those times I was too short to ride the Titan at Six Flags. Three some years later from that entry, I opened an email to find out that I not only was accepted to medical school, but also received a scholarship that erased that line, that feared line of too poor to survive. For that, I would like to extend my immeasurable gratitude to all the donors who've contributed to my medical education and made it possible, past and present, and to the Office of Financial Aid. Thanks to you, you've allowed me and my classmates to rest easy those worries. You've freed that space to instead be filled with musings on how to prevent hubris and maintain humility, with reflections on the complexities and constraints within which doctors and patients operate, with scientific hypotheses and clinical questions, new dreams and ideas and plans. Thanks to you, I get to be all I've dreamt of being. And thanks to you, as an inco incoming CHOP pediatric neurology resident, I get to help Philadelphia's kids get, be all that they dream of being too, I hope. I know that sounds cheesy, <laughs> but it's true. Mine is just one of the many stories that brought each vibrant student here to Penn but I hope this provides color to the richness and diversity of lived experience that characterize the outstanding human beings who surround me literally today uh, and from whom I have the great privilege to learn. My classmates and the people of Philadelphia, the largely black, brown, and poor communities whose backs built Penn Medicine and who continue to teach us medicine as our patients, they are what make Perelman, Penn Medicine, and Philadelphia so remarkable. I am exceedingly humbled by and grateful to you all for the opportunity to learn from them. I give these remarks as we emerge from an ongoing global pandemic and as a war 
wages in Ukraine. During a time when we've all felt the pains of distance, growing division, and the personal and collective loss of human life, the outreaching hand that your donations offer is felt all the more intimately too. So with that, with deep sincerity, on behalf of all the students represented here today, thank you for making our dreams of becoming a physician reality. Thank you also for allowing me the honor to be here with you all today and to tell my story. And here's to sharing a lovely evening together. Well, Shannon, thanks so much. Uh, I, I think, as you said, you, you represent the interests and experiences of a lot of people in this room. And we're very proud of, of all of you, and our expectations are very high. We know you're going to be able to give back uh, at various times in your career. So we're going to wrap up uh, the evening. Normally, we would have dinners with our uh, donors and re scholarship recipients, but because of COVID, we've decided you know, not to have meals indoors. But there are, at the registration desk, some takeaway boxes. So we want to make sure that you've got lots of energy for the next few days. So grab one of the takeaways and look forward to seeing you at some of the other events during Medical Alumni Weekend. Have a nice evening. <laughs>